We're starting a new sermon series called How to Change Your Life, okay? This is, this is uh, just, it's, it's time for change. People are wanting change. Uh, but I want to show you today, like, the biblical foundation that this is, this is part of the Christian life. It's, it's not just a matter of, well, it's a new year, new me. No, no, no. It's, it's, when you got saved, that's where the new you started. It's not about January 1st. It's about knowing Jesus Christ. And that, that is the change that happens in our lives. So I, 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 want to, I want to start with this because I, I think we're at a place that a lot of people are thinking like this. They're already thinking, I need to change some things. That, do you know who loves the mindset that you have of that? Planet Fitness. They love the fact that you want to change. Because they're going to get you to sign up with your credit card. And then we're going to go for two weeks. And then we're going to pay for two years. And, and that, that's where they make their money. And, and they're smart with that. You walk inside Walmart. There's going to be a display of, of different options of, of, of diet pills and vitamins. And there's going to be exercise machines. that you're going, to, you're going to fork out the money and just saying, I need to do something different this year. So you get it. But then what happens? <laughs> we stop. And New Year's resolutions don't last. But maybe for you, it's, it goes deeper than that. And I think for a lot of us, it does. It's, it's not just, I want to read more. I want to spend more time with family. I want to do this or I want to do that. It's a matter of, I want to stop living in fear. I, I want to get over this anxiety that I have. Or I, 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 want, to, I want to be more consistent with my walk with God. Or I want to, I want to, I want to forgive. Or I, I want to, whatever the spiritual things. Or maybe it is a bad habit. And may, maybe for some, it's like, man, I've struggled with this for years, and I just, I know I need the change, and I've tried, and, and I started this over and over again, and it never works, and you're just trying to figure out how to do that. So this will be a series that we're going to do in the book of Ephesians called How to Change Your Life. And it's not going to be me giving you the ideas, but me just walking you through scriptures of what the Bible says. And we're not doing this because it's a new year. We're doing it because it's in the Bible. And God has given us this instructions of how to change. Let me give you some principles. So I'm going to warn you now. <clears throat> we're going to go to Ephesians chapter 2. And that's where get our main passage is going to be. But I'm going to tell you, uh, 80% of my message today is going to be introduction. So <clears throat> when Paul was talking to the church, he was taking all these biblical principles. And then he was giving them to the church of what Jesus said for us to do. And how for us to change. And how for us to uh, live our lives out. So I, I want to take some of the things that we've already learned and establish some, some by just introduction. L let me give you this. Change is part of the Christian life. It is just part of it. It's, it's not just a matter, I'm saved and I'm on my way to heaven. It goes deeper than that. Let, let me tell you, when you got saved, you got on this path that God begins to change your life. And it's not just one and done. It's not just one service. It's not just one activity. Change then becomes a daily routine of what God wants us to do. So for anybody that have the mindset, well, this is just me and this is the way that I am. Nope, stop. Change is part of the Christian life. So I gave you this verse when we were doing the Bible study uh, last, last year when we were going into different subjects. One was on the subject of behold. And it was, uh, if any man be in Christ, oh, he's a new creature. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Now think about what God was saying in that. You don't stay the same. And I know we gave different application to that, of, of, of illustrating that. But the principle that God was giving us is old man, old things, old habits, old character should be passed away. And behold, watch this, God makes new things. Change is part of the Christian life. It's what God does. Romans speaks of this. Romans 8, 29, for whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed into the image of his son. God had a plan from the very beginning of you getting saved. He said, I'm going to do something in you. I know the old man, the old you, the old character, the old language, the old habits. I'm going to transform you into the image of his son. Do you know what term we use all the time when we're describing that? Christian. We're proud of that, aren't we? I am a Christian. What does that mean? I strive to be like Christ. So here's the thing, if we're not striving to be like Christ, we're really using the Christian term in vain. Oh, we love to beat the drum of that. I'm a Christian. I'm going to praise God and shout hallelujah that I'm a Christian. Well, let me tell you, if you are a Christian, 
It means that you strive to be like Christ. That verse tells us that from the very beginning of time when he saved you, he had a plan to conform you, to change you, to transition you to be in the image of his son. Now, I, I thank God it's not a level of perfection. We would, never, we would never accomplish that. But it's a matter of walking in his steps to be like Jesus Christ. Let me give you another one, Romans 12, 2. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed. Think about what he's saying. Don't conform to this world because that is the natural thing to do. It's to adapt to the world around us. What is popular? Everybody does it. Everybody talks that way. I don't care what TikTok does. I don't care what's trending. Be not conformed to this world. That's not me saying that. You say, I want to change. Well, let, let me tell you the change that God has for us. Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed. And the cool thing about transformation is the fact it's what God does from the inside out. It's not a matter of just trying to conform to something. You know what we do when we conform to something? We try to look like something else. We try to adapt to a look or adapt to a style or adapt to a, a culture or whatever. But he was teaching us to be renewed of the mind. Thank God it's a matter of what God does on the inside of us to change our thinking. God wants to do more than just change your actions or change your look or change how you talk. He wants to change how you look at things. You know why? That you might prove what is good and acceptable in the perfect will of God. So let me give you guys this. According to that verse, do you know what the will of God is? That you be transformed. You know what transformed is? God's not going to leave you to stay the way that you are. Change is part of the Christian life. Your character should change. Your attitude should change. Ephesians 4.23 says, be renewed in the spirit of your mind. That spirit in that mind right there is a lowercase spirit. It's not, it's not uppercase like the spirit of God, but the attitude of the mind. Literally, how I treat people, how I treat the world, how I treat people that disagree with me. It's the spirit of your mind. You know what he says that God's gonna do or God wants to do? Renew it. Do you know what renewing is? It's changing it. It's updating it. It's conforming it. So if you have that attitude that I'm just going to stay the same, whoa, stop, stop, stop. It's not up to you. If you are a Christian, you are a follower of Jesus Christ, change is part of the Christian life. It's not flipping on a switch. It, wouldn't it be great if the day that we got saved, we just knelt down and we walked up and we had no problem with our temper and we had no problem with yelling at, you know, at our spouses. Or, and we had none of those. All those things just went away. That, that would be great. But the Bible says when, he, when we got saved, he begins to do a work in our life. Paul put it like this, being confident of this very thing, that he which had begun a good work, okay, he started it, will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. So it's not just what he started in you. So let me tell you right now, you, you are, you're just kind of a diamond in the rough. You, you are a work in progress. But I tell you, the work in progress, that he began something, he's going to continue it. But that there should be progressive sanctification. The word sanctification literally means that God pulled you out of who you were to transition into you what he wants you to be. It doesn't stay the same. You shouldn't stay the same. There should be, never be this aspect of changing this, uh, or, or, or thinking that you're acceptable for who you are or staying where how you are. Let me give you another popular uh, verse that gives you a different perspective. When Jesus was building his church, he said, talk, talk to, to Peter, and he said, This I say unto thee, that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Now, we know this, that the church is not brick and mortar, okay? It's, it's not brick and mortar, but it's a matter of the church's people. And sometimes we can have just the mindset of that is God builds the church by, hey, we have a new church member. What is their name? Present them to the church. We just added another brick. But the word ecclesia, the church that he has there, literally means called out ones. Literally, God reaches into the world of where we were, and he pulls us out to change us into what? So the idea of building the church is not just adding to the church, it's changing the people of the church. Changing you to be a better mom, changing you to be a better teen, changing you to be a better ball player, changing you to be a better grandparent, 
He's changing you. He said this. He said, I'm going I'm to build my church. I'm, I'm going I'm to build you up. I'm going to do something. And it's, it's, it's founded on the rock of Jesus Christ that he does this. Let me say it again. Change is part of the Christian life. So I want you to do a self-evaluation for a minute. What has God changed in you that you can look back now that as we start 2023, what did God do in your life in 2022 to make you better? What did God bring to your mind, bring to your heart, saying, hey, that, that attitude, that habit, that language, that, that relationship, whatever was there before, should not mean you say, man, I, God's really worked in my heart. Because we, we want to see God work, but I'm asking you, how is he working in your life? And he said, how do you do that? Well, if you're saved, you have the Spirit of God living inside of you. He's constantly stirring your heart and doing those things. He's constantly working in you to change you into what he wants you to be. How is God working in your life right now? What has he done? And he just say, Pastor Tony, honestly, I don't know if I could point to something that is different in my life this year than last year. Then, then I'm telling you, that it's time for change. It's time for change. Here's the second thing. Change is not only part of the Christian life. Change should be par- obvious in your Christian life. Should be obvious. I, I know I'm just kind of like shooting a lot of verses. We'll get to, I, I'm trying to lay the foundation because Ephesians 4 gives us so many applications of spiritual habits that should be in our lives. But I want you, if, if you come in and just, well, I'm okay. Well, no, 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 you're not okay. None of us are okay because change is part of the Christian life. And secondly, change should be obvious in your Christian life. So Jesus is speaking and he's doing this illustration. I like preaching with illustrations, so I'm going to use Jesus' illustration, okay? This won't be the first time and won't be the last time that we ever use one of these as an illustration. So he's, he's teaching and, and he says this. He says, you are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be, uh, cannot be hid. So let me, let, let me just light this candle and illustrate this. This is what Jesus was saying as he's demonstrating this. He said, let me tell you that you are the light of the world. And I don't think they fully understood this. And that is the fact that there's not anything significant about you, but there's something powerful in you. And a lot of us want to change our lives and be a better this and a better that and change this and change that. But you think, I try so hard and I fail. Well, stop, stop. This is what Jesus was saying, and they didn't fully understand it because of the fact is they they were not yet experienced the Spirit of God. But Jesus came to introduce what he was going to do to change them. Follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. From the very beginning of the the ministry of Jesus was a matter of, watch this, how I'm going to change you. But when Jesus was explaining this, he said, you are the light of the world. Now, you guys know that when the Spirit of God lives inside of you, the Spirit of God is change. It's the presence of God with you. But the Bible says that the fruits of the Spirit is love and joy and peace and long-suffering and gentleness and goodness. Let's, okay, let's, you're the light of the world. You have the Spirit of God, the fruit, the light, the illumination, What comes out of you should be obvious. So let's put it like this. If you were a Christian, you are a dad, and you know Jesus Christ, joy and love and meekness and forgiveness should illuminate out of your life, should be obvious. he's, He's saying this to, he says, you are the light of the world, a city that is set on a hill it can't be hid. If, if you've ever been traveling, we, we just came back from Alabama. We were, we were going up 71 North, 75, and then you go around the corner, and then you just drive right over the hill to where Cincinnati is. I, I, I promise you can't hide that city. You know Fellowship Baptist Church and you and your family and your marriage should be like, like a city set on a hill to where when people get around you, it's not a matter of me beating a drum saying, you're all going to hell and you need Jesus, okay? It's, it's, it's illuminating out of your life to where the character around you is so obvious that people know there's something different about you. Do you guys hear me? There should be something obviously different. Now, now remember who was teaching this passage when he gave this. He said, you're the light of the world. Let me put it like this. The world could be the people that you uh, go to school with. 
people that are, are your neighbors. It could be your in-laws. It could be your own children. You're the light of the world. Listen to what he says. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick and give it light into all them that are in the house. Now, this is an illustration, and think about what we use candles for today. So maybe this disconnects. Uh, we use them to make the house smell better. Uh, we might use them when the power goes out for light, but most of the time, I mean, we don't deal with that in America a whole lot. But I mean, for them, in order to light a candle, it was a matter of they could not see without the candle. And he said, if, if what the purpose would be is you're going to hold it up in such a way, put it on a candlestick, where it gives the most light, the most impact from that candle. Now, you think about the application for us. It's not a matter of us bragging on ourselves, but we should be leaders or we should be examples in such a way that our kids, listen, our kids should be able to look at us and say, my dad is not perfect or my mom is not perfect or my grandparents are not perfect. But I know they have Jesus. Should be obvious. But here's the illustration that Jesus was saying. He said, this is what we don't do. He literally was talking about a bushel or a basket. That was the illustration and talked about the candle. He said, this is what we don't do. We don't take the candle and then put it on a bushel because what that does is it blocks the light. Nobody's going to see what that's going on. So let's just label this for what it is. This is the old you. This is a bad habit. This is the language. This is the, 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 the addiction. Let's just be real because here's how we are with our kids. Like we're going to, like Jesus is the way and I want you to go to church and I want you to listen to your mom and dad. And these are all things that come from the spirit of God that we should be doing in our lives. And then dad comes home and starts cussing and yelling at the kids. This is what the kids see. I'm just being honest. It's the same thing for those people at work where I'm going I'm to try to reach my, 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 the, my co-workers and things like that. But here's the thing. If you talk just like they do and you're perverted in your conversation and your jokes when you're talking about women and you run them down when God says to hold them up out of respect and purity. Or we get into the locker room where we talk to our buddies or we're, we're online gaming and we talk like everybody else and it comes out of our mouth. And I'm just saying that Ephesians 4 deals with those things. And, and they get around you and you're just saying, I have Jesus. Yes, you do. They just can't see it. And we wonder why we can't have an impact. Or when it comes time to Easter, and it's like, hey, I'd love you to come to our church. And they're thinking in the back of their mind, it's not done any good for you. Why would I go there? Just being honest. This is a problem. It could be so many different illustrations. It's a matter of, the Bible says, be kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as for Christ's sake has forgiven you. That's Ephesians 4, by the way. Okay, that's where we're going. You have a family member, a family reunion, and your mindset is, you know what? I wrote them off. They ticked me off. I'll never talk to them again. Here's your influence with your family. That's it. And we're talking about the light should be illuminating your life and it should be different in you. And you're like, well, you don't know what they did. You know what? I, I, you're right. I don't know what they did, but I do know what Christ has done for us. I know the difference that he makes in our lives. It, it's anything, this is anything that goes contrary to the word of God. This is anything that the Bible says is wrong and should not be there. But we cover up the light to be the old man or the old habit or the old way of doing things to where we block out the light. And people are like, I oh, know I'm saved. I'm not denying. I'm not denying that. Okay? There it is. It's, you're saved. Doing wrong things does not eliminate the, the salvation that God has in your life because you've been saved by the blood of Jesus Christ. I'm talking about the habits that we have in our life and the character. And you're saying it doesn't matter. It does matter. For even this generation, for us to come to church and us to say that the word of God is the authority of my life and God has a plan and I can trust God with my life and I can trust God to save me from eternal damnation of hell. Let me tell you, if that part is true about Jesus saving us and living he loved us and dying and all the verses that we sing about salvation, then so is the rest of the book. It's all true. 
But if we're going to claim salvation because we want to go to heaven and yet we have sex with our boyfriend or have sex with our girlfriend and we're trying to reach the world around us, they can't see it. And the world around us is going to hell and we're wondering why we're not having an impact. See, the thing is, the darker it gets around us, the brighter the light shines. It can be terribly dark out in this world. And I'm talking about every time we watch the news, and if you watch any Google News, Yahoo News, or whatever you get your news on, Apple and all these, you're, you're going to come across and like, oh my goodness, the world is just a mess. There should be something different in us. And by the way, change is part of the Christian life, and change should be obvious in the Christian. Should be obvious. And when it's not... We block it out, and the world wonders what's wrong with us because we're hypocrites, because we waste our time going to church and nothing happens. Jesus said in the last verse, let your light so shine before men that they might see the Spirit of God hidden inside of you. Did I say that right? Oh, that they might see your good works. You know, so often it's like, you don't know my heart. You're right, I don't know your heart but I know what's coming out of your heart. Do you realize that God ties it into where it's not just, you don't know my heart, and I, I have a good intention. I'm not denying that you don't love Jesus. I'm talking about that the world needs to see the change in your life. It says that you might, that, that might glorify God in your body. It's talking about literally through the words that you say, the actions that you have, the habits you display, the anger that you control, All of those things that give you the distinction that you are different than the world around you should be there. All of us want to change. We might not do it. But this time of year, we start New Year's resolutions. You know what the top ones are? Let me read them. Here's the top eight. Number one, exercise more. Number two, lose weight. Number three, get organized. Number four, learn a new skill. Number five, live a life to the fullest. Next, save more money, quit smoking, spend more time with family. 43% of all people, most of the time, fail or stop within the first month. One out of four, four, I know that I can do this. I just got back from Alabama, I've got to reboot, okay? <laughs> one out of four, one out of four quit in the first seven days. Only 9% of people that start a New Year's resolution end up fulfilling what they're going to do. Only 9%. So let me just tell you, the whole idea of um, January 1st, it's amazing how when we're going to lose weight, we'd be better not waiting for January 1st. You know what we do? We pack on the pounds like crazy because like, I'm going to eat this now because January 1st is coming. (laughs) And then we end up gaining 10 pounds because we're going to start on January 1st. Most of our, our bad habits come from the good intentions of starting new habits, but we just don't do it because there's a problem with us. If we're being honest, there's a problem with us. We make excuses. If we're being real, nobody starts something and tells everyone at work, guys, oh, it's a new me. I'm not eating those sweets and I'm not doing that. And I, and I only use diet as the illustration because it's the number one uh, uh, of what is on every list that I looked at. And then what happens? We fail because somebody has a birthday or somebody does this and we fall in and we give in to our flesh or whatever. But this is what we do. We go to our friends and we just tell them straight up, I'm lazy and I didn't do it. Is that what we do? Absolutely not. You know what we do? We make an a what? We make an excuse. Oh, and we're good at it. I wish our New Year's resolution was making new, better excuses because we would nail that. But we're so good at making up excuses. It's like if you got invited to a wedding and you don't want to go to the wedding. You can't say to someone, I'm just telling you the truth. It's hard to say, I don't want to go to your wedding. Nobody can say that. So what do we do? We give them an excuse. Not just an excuse. When you talk to your spouse about it, you know what you say? We need a good excuse. Okay, we we need to up the bar on this one. You know, it's like, we, we have to come up with something. Don't we have that thing? And what about the kids and whatever? We're, we're just good at it. But the, the problem is that we do that in life as well. 
We just don't admit, you know, I'm really prideful or I'm arrogant or I have this or that. We come up with excuses and we're good at doing that. Do you know what an excuse is? An excuse is something offered as justification or grounds for being excused. Let me put it in layman's terms like this. An excuse is when you blame something else. That's what an excuse is. It's just like, well, it wasn't my fault. We do this all the time. It's just like when it comes to uh, starting something new in the new year, just, well, I just didn't have the time. Isn't it funny that we won't have the time to do, read our Bible? You know, and just like, I started, I just don't have the time. Uh, how's that network Netflix series? Like, I'll binge watch last night. Got four episodes done. Well, okay, you didn't have the time. I'm just being real. When it comes to a lot of things in our life, you have the time for what you make the time to do. It's a matter of the heart drawing you into a direction to want to do that. And I'll get there in a minute, but it's a matter. We, we get things out of order. But we often blame the, 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 the reason for something else. It's, it, this is funny. When we have excuses about our character, like I have an anger temper or I have a, a temper problem or an anger issue or whatever it is, this is the dumbest thing. It's like, well, I'm Irish. Okay. I, I'm serious. This is stuff that people say. So you're telling me because your grandpa, grandpa's grandpa grew up in a foreign country and something about growing up there makes you yell at your wife and kick your dog? What what, what is up with that? Do you know what it is? It is an excuse. We're so good at it. Well, I cuss all the time or I get mad at the kids and I say, don't do as I do, do as I say because of the fact is you justify it because you work in an environment where other people are cussing. It's just, it's just we, we have an excuse for everything that we do. We can justify it. I, I, I drink, I yell, I do this, I do that, and we can blame something. Here's the problem. Problem number one, our excuses do not line up with God's word. And we just need, we just need to acknowledge that. Your excuse, my excuse, does not line up with God's word. So I don't care what we sit there and throw out, you know, as spouses, it's like we, we get into arguments with people or our spouses and like, I need to change this. Honey, I'm going to the new year and let, give me this and I'm going to be a new man. And I'm going to be a new woman, all this. And then when we don't, we throw out that excuse. Here's what we, we, we need to stop the excuses because here's the problem. Your excuse does not line up with God's word. And by the way, when I say God's word, I'm also saying God's authority over your life. It doesn't line up. Let me give you the verse again. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what's good and acceptable and perfect will of God. You realize that what the desire of your God is, is for you to change. So to say that you can't change is going against the will of God. We we just need to stop. Stop making excuses. When you say that I can, this is just the way I am, and I'm Irish blood, Italian blood, whatever blood you are, what about the blood of Jesus Christ that has the power to change you? That, that, that's the blood that we should be claiming as we go through this. God has called us to change, and God holds, uh, God holds way more authority than, than any excuse that we have. Here's another problem. Our excuses are hurting the ones that we love. It, it, it's time you just whatever problem that you have and, and that issue is not just there it's one thing you pass it on to your kids let, let me just give you some sound advice you telling your kids do as I say not as I do is worse than you you just don't say the statement at all well I want better for you kids and that's why I do this and that's why I get on no 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 there's a word for that what is it oh hypocrite you're just a hypocrite don't, don't get mad at me saying it because your kids are already thinking it. I'm just helping you out. But when it's a matter of don't do as I do, do as I say, it, it's hypocritical. And by the way, that doesn't line up with God's word. Be thou an example is what the Bible says. To, to lead them and to guide them, to be in the image of Christ. You know what Christ did? He set an example. Follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. Follow me and I'll show you what to do. The truth is, your lack of character is ruining your influence with your kids. It just is. It's, it's, it takes a lot of truth to, to, to swallow that pill, to, to, to be able to say, you're right, I, I am not being the effective parent that I should be because I am not doing the right thing. So, so how, how do you change your life? I'm just trying to lay the foundation. Number one, it's got to start with us stop making excuses. You need to get in your mind 
that changing for the better and changing to be like Christ is part of the Christian life. And the change in your life should be obvious and it shouldn't be this excuse anymore, well, you can't see my heart. I can't, but I can see your bad attitude and I can see your negative all the time and I can see that you hold grudges and I can see that you yell. I can see that. That they might see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. I told you, long introduction, shorter message today. So you're all looking saying, he hasn't even given us points yet. He said, turn in Ephesians, he's not read one verse. Let me read the one verse. Paul is writing to the church in Ephesus, and he's talking to them about how to change their life. But in chapters 1, 2, and 3, he talks about the doctrine. And I've preached and taught the doctrine in Ephesians 1, 2, and 3. It's not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. He talks about the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross and what God's came to do to save us and to change us. And all these doctrinal truths... Then we get to chapter 4, and he says these words, therefore. And then he begins to give us application. Do you know why in chapter 4, verse 1, he can say the words, therefore? Because he's telling you, because you're looking back and seeing the fact that you are saved, and you have the Spirit of God dwelling inside of you, and you're no longer the same, it's not a matter of a change of mind or a change of date or January 1st. It's all because of what God does in your life that you can't do for yourself. And Paul begins to give application. He gets very practical about anger and forgiveness in the way we talk, the way we treat people. He talks about, just simply put, habits that will change your life. That's what he's saying. So Ephesians 2.10, and I'm just going to break this verse down and then we'll be done. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus under good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. It's time to stop making excuses because of the fact is that you belong to God. Read the first verses again, but just as as it comes up. For we are His. I, I can keep going, I can explain that, and I will. But if we could just start with the fact that, by the way, you belong to God. Your mouth, your brain, your habits, your past, all of these things that we have in our life now belong to God. So to have the mindset and the attitude that I think I'm okay, or I don't see anything wrong with this, or my wife gets on to me, but I don't care, and all that was stop. Just put all those other opinions aside, and let me just give you one. You belong to God. Now, the world would not acknowledge that because if I know that I belong to God, it means that I have to submit to God. In order to submit to God, I have to admit that my opinion and my perspective doesn't matter. But we all have an issue with pride that tells me, you know what, I'm okay. And just go ahead and have that mindset, and that's how you become a mom and dad that have no respect in your kids Uh, might nod their head in agreement with you, but they don't respect you. I'm just telling you the truth. You belong to God. Paul even said this in 1 Corinthians 6, 19, when he was frustrated with them about their mindset and their attitude. And he said, what? Listen to this. Have you ever done that with your kids before where they're doing something and they say something, you turn around and go, what? You know, like, whatever is about to happen or be said is just a matter of, it's not acceptable, okay? What? Do you not know, I'm paraphrasing, that your body belongs to God? You do not belong to yourself. Know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you. Literally, your body, your wax, okay? You have the Spirit of God living inside of you. You are not your own. Somebody else bought you with a price, took you over what you have of God, and you are not your own. Could, I, could it be spelled out any more simplistic? It's not about you. Your opinion about your bad habit doesn't matter. Somebody else owns the key to your heart now. For you are bought with a price. Therefore, because you are bought with the fire, you are to glorify God, not just in your heart, not just in your spirit, but he says, glorify God in your body. That is the things that you do, the things that you say, the way that you treat people, 
glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. You want to change your life here? Let me give you some practical steps, and we'll get more practical steps as we get into this. I know it's stop making excuses, but here's, here's the next level of this. Surrender your life to God. And, and, I, and I know we say spiritual things like that all the time. It's just a matter of this moment right now, just simply saying, am I okay? Am, am I doing the right things? It's like my wife gets on to me for how I do this, but am I okay? Are, are you happy with the way that I talk? Are you happy with the way that I date? Are you happy with that habit that I have? Because I justify and I explain it and I, I have my reasons for it and I'm this and I'm that. But the, the thing is, does the one that owns your life, is he okay with that? And by the way, he's not going to leave you in the dark. So I just don't know what God wants. Oh, he's telling you. Just keep reading Ephesians 4. He doesn't leave us in the dark. And by the way, when you don't do it God's way and you do it your way, it doesn't work because you don't belong to yourself. We, we, we hijack what God has and we're trying to run away to do it our own way and it doesn't work. Ask God, teach me to be the dad that I need to be. God, I'm, I'm a mess. I belong to you. Show me, teach me. Number one, you belong to God. Stop making excuses. It's not up to you. Number two, acknowledge this, that he has a better plan for you. When we talk about God can change your life and he has a great plan and all these things, sometimes we don't fully understand even what we're saying. But, but, but it's a matter of everything that God's about to say is he's about to teach you that he's going to bring you into something better. Every time God gives you something in the Bible, he's not trying to rob you from something that you enjoy. He's trying to give you something better. Read Ephesians 2, 10, okay? For we are his workmanship. I know we are his. We belong to God. But he goes into and he says, we are his workmanship. Okay? His workmanship, literally, you could say it like this. You are his project. We have the mindset that I can't do it. I can't do it. You're right. But you, you need to get into this, that God's going to get a hold of your life. And he, he's going to say, you are his project. So I had a, I had a problem with my house. I had... Um, I replaced all the windows in my house when I bought my house. I, owned a bank, I bought a bank-owned house, and it sat for a number of years, and they had a bunch of issues, things like that. We had a bonus room that was downstairs, and it was a bigger room. We used it for uh, an office and the kids doing school and things like that. Uh, but Jordan was using it, and he walked in there and he says, Dad, did you see how bad this is? So on the side of the house, it just, it doesn't get sun and it got mildew on it, all this other stuff. And I had this, it was always a problem. It was always a headache. But that window right there, I replaced the two bottom ones, but I couldn't replace the top one because it was in that weird spot. But on the inside of it, it was leaking. And it wasn't just leaking, it was rotting out the house. It was, it was doing it there, it was going down, and it was literally, I don't have a picture of it, but it was rotting out the bottom part and even the, the subfloor and everything. I had a big issue. So Jordan, my very smart kid, brings me in there with a really expensive idea. And he says, Dad, this could be my bedroom. I'm so, okay, I, I, I'm listening. And he says, if this is my bedroom, I'd like to turn it into more of a master suite. And I'm like, okay, that, that doesn't sound difficult by any means. And, and he began to lay out this plan uh, of making it better. And, and Jordan knows how to get me because I, I, I like projects. I, I like to be uh, a creator of things. I, I, I like to work with my hands. So here we go. We, we, Jordan began to teach me and show me what we could do with the mess. So the window, that was a problem. You can see it patched at the bottom and things like that. It was all a mess right there. So we, we, we ripped it out. You say, why did you do that? It wasn't working. It, it didn't match with the vision that I had. I, I wanted to build it up and make it better. So I had to take out what shouldn't be there. And let me tell you, when God begins to do a work in your life, sometimes it's going to be uncomfortable and sometimes you feel like, I'm just a mess and I'm falling apart and it doesn't make sense. Stop. The one that has the, owns the house has a plan to make it better. God begins to work in your life and to do things that you couldn't even imagine. People come in and say, man, the neighbors just made a mess of their house. No, we put in a new window, took out that oval thing on top, and we began to frame it in and make it into what God, well, in my situation, what I wanted it to be. You say, well, how could you do that? It was my house. 
Here's the thing that about it too is I, I, had, I had plans that everybody else didn't know. I knew that when our parents came to visit, I wanted a place for them. I knew that I wanted, and thank God we had it when Logan was going through his recovery and everything from his surgery. We had a, a, a bottom floor for that. I, I knew the plans that I had for that, but in order to get it here, I had to submit to the one or submit to the plans or, or, or rip out what was wrong to make it better. Let, let me tell you guys, it's not a house, but you that God's trying to change. You belong to God and God comes into your life and he has, he has a plan, okay? What God begins to do is says that leaky window has to go. That negative attitude, the way that you argue all the time, the way that you, you have no patience, the way that you're not kind to people, the way that you tell off that waitress because she didn't bring your food out or it was cold. It, it doesn't line up in the image of God and God's going to change you. But I tell you, he has a plan. Now, let me show you how this works when God has a plan for us, and I'm almost done. It says, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works. The plan that he has for you is to make you better. He he literally says, created in Christ Jesus. He has a plan, if you follow the plan, to make you a better dad, to make you a better mom, to make you a better witness, to make you a better ball player, a better student, a better grandparent. He has a plan to make you better. And it's not just on the inside of feelings and peace, but it literally says, unto good works. The world is craving something better. And they're tired of driving past churches with steeples. They need to be seeing people of character. They need somebody in the locker room that's going to stand up and declare and do what is right and not just go with the flow because that is putting the basket on top of it and you blend in with everything. Your work needs somebody that's going to stand up and say, that's not right and I'm not doing it or I'm not going to talk that way or I'm not going to laugh at that joke. You know why? Because it doesn't display Jesus Christ. Should be different. And, and, and here's what he says. It, it's not just the fact that God has these plans, that you belong to God and God has a better plan. But you've got to let God work in you. And this will launch right into next week. For you are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus under good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Now, now, now let me show you this. We're trying to break a cycle here because your, 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 your wife says, I, I'm tired of this and I can't take this. And you say that to your wife and all these different things that happen. And God says, stop, stop. That what God does is he wants to change you from the inside out. That, that what he's teaching us through this passage is to walk in them. Literally, he has a plan. And you say, I, I need this to be practical. We'll make it practical. But the idea is, as God speaks, this is alive. This is coming from your master, the maker. He's not just speaking words. He's speaking to your heart. Do you know why it's so important that our teens go to conferences and hear messages? You know why Monday night, if you are 18 to 25, you need to show up at Catalyst tomorrow night? Do you know why next Sunday morning at 9.30 or 11 o'clock you need to be in here? Because this is how we learn how to change our lives. And that is not justification saying skip church and read your Bible at home because God has a plan for both of those things in your life. You need both of them. But I'm telling you, if you don't know, if you're not hearing what to do, you don't know what to live out. We should not walk in this world wondering what God wants from us. To walk in them. Let me show you in Ephesians 4 19. Who being past feeling have given themselves over to lasciviousness. I'm sure I said that wrong, but let's just go with it. But in the times past, you had an attitude of this. That, that concept of that word literally means you had the attitude of who cares. It doesn't matter. It means that you had a hard heart. That's what you gave yourself over that. And when somebody come up to you and be like, I don't care. This is just who I am. You want to mess with me? You want to, you want to get in my face? You want to tell me what? And he says, in that time past, that's who you were. You guys know that. Teenagers, I like, get out of my face. I'll do what I want. I can't wait till I'm 18. That's what that Bible verse is describing. It's just like, it's just that hard heartedness. You shouldn't be dating that way. Who are you to tell me? I'll do what I want. Get out of my business. It's the time passed, though. That was the feeling of your heart. That was the emotions you displayed. That was the actions that you demonstrated. And the time's passed. Behold, all things have become new. It says this was the work of uncleanliness and greediness. That attitude brought about nothing good. And I tell you, if you continue it in your life, it'll bring about nothing good in your life. 
I don't, I don't care how many new leaves you turn over. I don't, I don't care all these different things that we do. I, I do it all day long. Until there's a change of heart, there will never be a change of you. It's got to be this way. It says in verse 20, but ye have not so learned this of Christ. If so be that ye have heard him, ye have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus. Here's the beautiful thing of what happens. You say, you want to know how to change your life? When you stop making excuses and you're justifying, you say, okay, God, what do you want me to do? God speaks to your heart and all of a sudden, it's not just an outline. It's not just Ephesians 4.19. It's not just going to class. It's, it's, it's not just life group anymore. All of a sudden, the word of God does something drastic in your life. It brings conviction. Conviction is something that mom and dad cannot bring. It's something that a teacher can't bring. It's nothing that a pastor can bring. It's something that only the Holy Spirit can bring. Conviction is to be fully convinced in your heart to change. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. You know what faith is? Faith is a conviction in your heart that I need Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior and I repent of my sins and you did that to get saved. But I tell you, he keeps doing that because every time you're under the influence of so learning Christ, you keep learning about him and he keeps bringing conviction, which keeps bringing you closer to him. But we live in a society and a generation that rather make up excuses of why they don't go to church rather than changing their life. You want to know one of the best decisions you can make in 2023 to change your life is just come next week and come next week and come the next week and so learn Christ. He changes your mindset, the renewing of your mind. He changes your heart. It's no longer your wife saying, are you ever going to change? God shakes you up on the inside saying, I need to change. And when you get off track, I don't care if it's January 9th and I get off track, I don't go back to the same ways because it's Jesus pulling me back and not a date of a new year. It's conviction. And God begins to work in you. You know why? Because you are his workmanship. He's got a plan for your life and he's gonna turn you into something you never thought you could be. Here's the thing, stop making excuses. You say, I just tried and I tried and I can't. You can't because you can't, okay? And you never will. You're like, well, that's really encouraging. You can't, but he can. You just need to so learn Christ. Let your life be the workmanship, but you can't have that until you so walk in the truths of God's word.